I first want to talk a bit about flooding-based consensus, which is uh, relatively simple, actually. So what I'm going to assume are uh, fill crash semantics, or fill stop semantics, I should say. That's my uh, mistake. Reliable failure detection, which is a very important assumption, and uh, unreliable communication. Okay, so that's, that's, still, uh, that's still okay. Now the whole basic idea is I have a group of processes and what they do is they send each other commands and don't forget what they're trying to do is to reach consensus on which command to execute next. Okay, so the process of multicast, they're proposed operations. So I have a process group, I'll give an example in just a minute, a process group of four. Uh, they have operations to execute and every process says, well, I'd like to do this, okay? And they could have gotten these operations from clients that have been contacting individual processes and will you please execute this operation for me. They all apply, very important, the same selection procedure. So if each of these processes gets a list, the same list of operations to execute, they will apply exactly the same selection mechanism and based on that they will apply, they will execute exactly the same command. Okay? Now the problem is what happens when a process fails during this uh, uh, multicast. So the whole idea is I'm going to tell, I have this list, I'm going to tell my other buddies, hey, this is my list, okay? So everybody in the end should receive the same list. Well, you get this scheme. Let me see if I can get my pointer to work. I'm having a hell of a job with, okay, here it is. Let me see if I can keep it up and running. I have four processes here. I use these kind of small bubbles to indicate that you're doing a multicast in the sense that I'm sending you something, you something, you something, you something, etc. one by one, okay? So it takes a while before you can actually complete this. It's not an atomic multicast that I can just send to everybody in one go. So let's assume, mouse is gone again. God, this is terrible. Oh, wait a minute, maybe I can, got it. Uh, and it's gone again, okay. So here I have my, three pr my four processes. P1 sends its operations to P2, and after that it crashes. P2, P3, P4, they just apply the algorithm. They flood their operations to the others. P1 has crashed, and now I get into a situation that P2 received from the other buddies exactly all the operations. So P2 is now the one who has all the operations and can actually decide, hey, I'm gonna do number X. P3 received only the operations from P2 and P4. It has to wait. Okay? Why does it have to wait? And the, now the tricky thing is, it knows P1 has crashed, because that's under my assumptions. Okay? I'm assuming fill stop semantics, and I said I have a reliable failure detection. So P3 knows P1 crashed. Yet, it cannot take a decision on which operation to execute. Why not? Exactly. So it knows what it receives. It knows that P1 just crashed. That's all there. But it doesn't know what P2 and P4 received. So it knows it has an incomplete list, but it doesn't know if P2 and P4 have an incomplete list. And it may very well be that the operation that needs to be executed was exactly the one that was actually proposed by P1, who crashed, but hey, who cares? So what needs to be done is that P3 needs to wait until it knows what P2 has been doing. Well, P2 could take a decision, it knew all the operations, it also detected that P1 crashed, so it tells the others, hey, this is what I did. As soon as that message arrives, P3, in this case also P4, know what to do. They just follow P2's decision. Okay? 
So what happens during this process if P3 crashes? Okay, so let's assume that P3 crashes after P2 has taken a decision on what to do. Exactly. If P4 and P2 will both detect that P3 crashed. Hey, no harm done. And by induction, you now see that in the end, every, and now here's the important thing, every non-faulty process will take exactly the same decision. So they reach consensus. Okay? That was easy, right? Okay, so let's, uh, that, okay. let's, let's assume that P3 crashes before P1 ever, uh, uh, crashed, right? It didn't send anything. So it's, this, th this is important. So P3 crashes before having sent anything. Okay. So uh, let's assume that uh, um, P1 also crashed, you know, but after sending one message. So here we have it. P2 has messages from uh, P1 and P2 itself and P4. Um, P3 is just dead. Okay, but it has been detected that, is, that it crashed. And P4 also received messages, this, uh, received a message from P2. P4 is, has not crashed. So we have P1 that crashed after sending one message to P2. P2 is up and running. Uh, P3 crashed before sending any message. Okay. It didn't send anything. And uh, P2 now has messages from P1, uh, sorry, and P4 also sent its messages. So P2 now has a message from P1. It knows itself what it would like to do and has a message from P4. Yes? And P3 is crashed, P1 is dead. P4 only received a message from P2, and that's it. And it knows itself what it, what it wants to do. And P2 and P4 both detected that P1 and P3 crashed. What do they know? They didn't receive a message. But P2 does not know. P2 knows it didn't receive a message from P3. Does P2 know that P4 didn't receive a message? Hold it. Very important in these type of games. No additional assumptions. And, we've, and, we, and we, we stick to the rules. But you're, 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 you're not playing by the rules. So what was the, what was the fundamental rule? They need to reach consensus. What does that mean? And the answer actually to my question had already been given by you. But you may not even know it. The fundamental rule is, the fundamental rule was, and that's the reason why you already gave the answer. There were four processes. The group consisted of four processes. And we, reach, we need to reach consensus on the operation to execute among those four processes, regardless whether one of them dies in the meantime. The problem is that P2 has only three, including its own operation, and it knows it's not going to get another one. Okay? And uh, does it know that? No, it doesn't know that yet. P4 has only two. And let me phrase it like this. It also knows that it's in a bad shape. So what can P2 and P4 do? Basically, that means let's decide on what the new group is. That was your answer. Okay? Well, basically what you'll need to do, and this is something that, is, uh, that makes most of this stuff often a bit more intricate, they need to reach consensus on what the new group is. So they need to reach consensus on the group membership. Once they have that, then they can decide, oh, we got all the messages from all the group members, and then they can proceed. So they first need go, they have to go through the phase where they kick out group members. And kicking out means we'll remove them from our current list of group members. We can reach consensus on that. Once we have that, we can take a decision on the operations that need to be executed. 
And that to a certain extent actually happens in the second phase after the flooding because in this case a decision is actually forwarded to the others and the interesting thing about the second part which my I would oh this part is that it is now based on a decision of an ex group member but you can easily imagine that after this they will decide hey from now on it's just the three of us in this example and they actually go through a phase where they install a new group. You can reach agreement on uh, will we take into account old operations or not. But it's a very good point. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to Paxos. So this is now my big experiment. Um, we're going to talk about um, an asynchronous system. And like I said, the communication can be unreliable. We can have mess messages corrupted, um, but that's detectable. All operations are deterministic. I mean, you do an operation and it, there's no, um, an operation cannot be interrupted. Let me, let me just keep it simple. Um, and processes may exhibit halting failures, not arbitrary failures, um, and also they don't collude. Okay, so it's kind of a straightforward situation. I have stripped down the Paxos algorithm to the essential, uh, meaning that what I'll be discussing is not what is used in practice. And there's even one version that is considered as, as the simple version that has a so-called leadership in it. I removed that as well. And this is as, as, as simple as I think it can get. And, but I'll have my, my peers review uh, me on, on this explanation. And if by, by stripping it down really to its bare essentials, it turns out that it's actually not that difficult. I was telling colleagues yesterday, today I'm going to do for the first time, I'm going to explain Paxos. Oh, good luck. Okay, so here we go. This is essential Paxos. Just pay attention because I think I've really made it reasonably simple. So the way that you can think of this is that you have a collection of replicated threads or processes and they collectively fulfill a, the, a, a number of roles, four roles. And I think now in the, in the uh, uh, updated book I'm talking about processes. I'll come back to this in just a minute. We have a client which is a thread or a process that simply requests an operation to be performed. So it's your client that sends off an operation to this group of processes. You have learners, these are the guys that actually execute the, this operation in the end. You have an acceptor, that is a thread that operates in a quorum, uh, to vote for the execution of an operation, and you have the proposer. And the core is really formed by the interaction between proposers and acceptors. And what Paxis will guarantee, just a minute, what Paxis will guarantee is safety, Nothing bad will happen, okay? That means that uh, essentially it's correct. And what you will do in practice is modify my explanation of the algorithm in such a way that you can also guarantee liveness, may, namely that you will make progress. And informally it means if sufficient processes remain non-faulty, then a proposed operation will eventually actually be executed which is uh, kind of an important assumption. Is this theory? No, this is not theory. To give you an idea, um, Google has implemented the real version of Paxis and is using this as one of its crucial elements to hand out locks. Okay, just to give you an idea, this uh, practice is just around the corner again. Okay, so this is, this is the model that you should have of Paxis. Here are your let me get this mouse working, here it is. Here you have your clients, and I'm taking a look at a single client here that's going to forward a operation to this dark gray server process, and that dark gray server process is running on a single machine and consists of three, call it sub-processes, a proposer, an acceptor, and a learner. And what these guys will do is these server processes will talk to each other and notably the proposers will talk to the acceptors 
The acceptors will talk to the proposers, and the acceptors will also talk to the learners. Okay? That's the model that you should, should take. And you can easily imagine that if you would start implementing this and optimizing, you will flatten these three rules into a single intricate piece of code. And then, you know, you will be switching between your role as a proposer and an acceptor and a learner. But again, if you separate these things, you get these three learners. Okay, let's try to go through the algorithm. Paxis consists of two phases. Each phase is subdivided in two subphases. So I have a proposer P, and I'm assuming that every proposer P has a unique identifier, I. And it communicates only with a quorum, a majority of acceptors. Okay, so going back to this one over here, what I have is this proposer over here is going to talk at least, and I'm going to simplify things a bit, at least to a majority of these acceptors. Okay. Now, it has this requested operation command. That, came from, that, that came from a client. Okay? It says, okay, I want this command to be executed. It tells the acceptors. So what it does, it selects a counter, I've called this a counter, a counter n that is higher than any of its previous counters. There's no magic here. It just has some stuff and it can, it can draw a higher counter. And that leads to a proposal number and that proposal number, oh, whoops. Oh shit, this is really bad. That n should have been m, okay? Leads to a proposal number r is m comma i. If you read li uh, literature on uh, Paxis, uh, they will be talking about round numbers. And that's the reason why I'm using r. But I'll just talk about proposal numbers. Now, proposal numbers are ordered according to this. If you have uh, an m comma i and an n comma j, then m comma i is less than n comma j, if and only if n is less, m is less than m, or if the two are the same, you take the process identifier into account. Okay, so there's a total ordering of these proposal numbers. This is also a very reasonable assumption. There's no magic here. And then what a proposal does, it says, I have this command, accept us prepare. And what, it's, what it does, it sends its proposal number to these acceptors. Okay, so far so good, that's easy. Now the goal is that the proposer tries to get his proposal number anchored. It says, okay, I have this proposal number and I want you, acceptors, to start working with my proposal number. And now the interesting thing is, it really would like to have the acceptors work on its proposal number with the command that it actually proposed. But what we'll see in just a minute is that an acceptor is no, that a proposer is willing to drop its command in favor of another command that was already there at the acceptors. But it's very important, to, it's my turn, it says. Unfortunately, it will have to perhaps uh, take its turn with a different command. But again, the proposers are collaborating in this, so they really couldn't care less about which command they want to have executed, okay? What an acceptor does, this is an important part. It gets a proposal number from a proposer. So it checks, hey, this is the highest I've ever seen from any proposer. And what it then does is say, okay, it's so high, I will promise that I'm going to stick to this proposal number, okay? So it's gonna send back later, say, okay, I promise I will not work on any lower proposal number. What that work means, I'll, I'll come to that in just a minute. Okay, this is part of this anchoring process. Now your proposal number is suddenly, um, how shall I put this? It's, uh, it's, 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 in, it's in the works, so to say, okay? You, you, as a proposer, you just made progress. You have acceptors saying, sure, we'll go for your proposal number. However, if an acceptor already said, yeah, you know, I, I really like to go for your proposal, but I already promised somebody else that I would go for another command. So basically, he said, I already accepted another command. What it tells the proposer then is, listen, it's your proposal number, but it's going to be this command. 
And when it sends back to a proposal, say, I already accepted this command with this proposal number. Get the picture? You have these acceptors that get these proposals from proposers, and they're sending back saying, listen, I, uh, I already accepted this command. And they said, I, will, I accepted this command with the associate proposal number, which by definition is lower than the one they just got from the proposer. It will essentially get a higher priority. Basically saying, I accepted this with this lower proposal number, and what it's going to tell the proposer, listen, we can make a deal. This command, your proposal number. Okay? And that's where the proposal will switch. Otherwise, if a proposer is sending you something with a lower proposal number, hey, go away. Okay? Because I'm already operating on a higher proposal number, and very important, I promised I have to, I have to go I have to go through the whole protocol. And what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm aiming at is that by the end of this lecture, you grab the essence which is very difficult. And I, I, I can tell you it's, it was very difficult for me. I had to ask all my peers, What's, why does this work? And if you can get an idea of why this works, I'll be very, very happy. Okay? Now, let's just continue. Here's the accept phase. And we'll go through an example, and you'll just see the whole thing work. Okay. So now the, the proposers, they got their stuff back, so it's their turn. Okay, and this is now where you can actually, you have, may have to switch to another operation. It's very simple. If it did not receive any operation, hey, happy camper. Okay, because it didn't get anything back from the acceptor saying, well, you know, hey, your proposal number, I didn't promise anything. I'm not working on an accepted command, so hey, tell me what you got. Okay, so it sends and accepts its proposal number and its command to the acceptors to the majority at least, in this case. It could also be, and here comes the tricky part, it, it contacts multiple acceptors, right? So it may be in a position that it gets multiple accepted commands back, different ones. So what it does, it selects the command with the highest associated proposal number. That's basically what you just mentioned, right? It's, kind of, it's not an overwrite, but it's, it's ignoring the ones with lower proposal numbers. Don't worry, they will get back into the system later on, okay? They'll, they'll get their turn. But what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I get these, these things back from the acceptors, and I'll pick the command, the operation, with the highest associated proposal number. And that was an associated proposal number of accepted commands. And then you can see what the proposal will do. It will then broadcast that thing back to the acceptors. And this is a very important one. So formally what it does, it receives one or more accepted operations. It sends an accept R command star back. And command star is the operation whose proposal number is highest among all accepted operations received from the acceptors. Yes. I'm still talking about the single proposer. So that's, and that's the easiest way of thinking of it right now. Okay? So a proposer says, prepare proposal number. It gets back commands from, this is the bad scenario, it gets commands back from the acceptors. It picks the command with the highest associated proposal number, attaches it proposal, its own proposal number, and sends that back to the acceptors. Do you see what it's doing? It's driving the acceptors to consensus. So strangely enough, the proposer first had this idea, hey, this is the stuff that needs to be executed. It says, hey guys, prepare yourself. Oh shit, gets a lot of commands back. And basically what it does, it says, okay, let me pick the command to execute and I will tell you. And because it's always communicating with a majority of acceptors, it's driving a majority of the acceptors towards the same command. 
because an acceptor may have its previously accepted command overruled by a, by a response from the, uh, from the uh, proposer. But it will know that that thing is actually sent to all the acceptors. Okay? And that was actually the last one. The acceptor receives these, uh, these uh, accepts our command message. If it did not send a promise back with a higher proposal number, this can happen because, hey, acceptors uh, drop dead, so to say. It has to accept this command. And once it's really accepted this command, it says so to the learner, say, hey, guys, this is what I did. And now the interesting thing is a learner, which is the third process, will say, well, acceptor. If you're the only one telling me to do this, uh, this, this uh, command, I'm not going to do it. I need a majority of the acceptors to tell the same thing. If that's the case, let's go for it. And then the learners will actually execute that thing. Okay? And that's in this observation. The essence of Paxos is that the proposers drive a majority of the acceptors to the accepted operation with the highest anchored proposal number. And it's, it's, when you think of it, it's beautiful. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of slides that I shamelessly copied from, from Hein, uh, hein Meling, Meling, who's an associate professor at, uh, at Stavanger. Uh, Hein went to San Diego. There, there, there are a couple of uh, uh, Paxos gurus over there. And he did a sabbatical, and he was working for about a year on this kind of stuff. And uh, halfway through, I, I talked to him and said, Hein, Hein, you know, do you, could you claim that you now understand Paxos? He said, yeah. Okay, okay Hein, you got to explain it to me because I don't understand this thing at all. And he did. Okay? So we had this workshop at a certain point, and he was one of the, spe uh, the speakers. And he was just lecturing Paxos. And he had this brilliant set of slides saying, um, Paxos made insanely simple. And it was a question mark, isn't this too simple? Well, actually, I think I made it even more simpler, so that, I, that may actually make me insane. But uh, all credits go to Hein, okay? But it's because of Hein that I now think I understand Paxis. So Hein, here you go. Here's the system. And uh, I really think he made a brilliant set of slides. He could make it more intricate, but this is probably the simplest case, including all the problematic cases that you may think of. So what I'm showing over here, now I gotta get my mouse to work, acceptor, the proposers, acceptors, the learners. They have state variables, namely the current proposal number. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, this one, yep. The current proposal number, the operation to execute. Then the um, acceptors have, each have a state, a Whoops, uh, record, I don't know where this mouse is. I don't know why this is not working. Okay, the P stands for um, the highest proposal number, okay, that they promised to adopt. The L is for the, the last proposal number that they have seen for which they have accepted the operation, and the O is then the accepted operation. Okay, that's the whole idea. And we're going to play with the P and the L. So what happens? Here's the protocol. And notes, this is the normal case. So I have my proposer up there, and it, uh, it proposals, uh, has proposal number one. And it sends a prepare to all the acceptors. So far, so good. They say, okay, we've just seen one. So we'll, we'll, we'll promise one. We don't have anything else to do, so hey, we just, uh, we just promised that we'll go for number one. Send that back to the proposer. Proposer's happy. It says, good, here's my command, X. So accept X. So what will happen is that all these guys say, well, okay, we're going to accept X. We saw the highest proposal number that we proposed that was one. We accepted X with proposal number one. And as soon as they... Sorry, as soon as a uh, acceptor sees something like 11x, one, one hey, it tells the learners, I, I'm done, you know. I have an accepted proposal with the right proposal number. Learners, go ahead. And they broadcast this to the learners, and then 
Is this slide over there? No, that's the problematic case. The learners, they receive X. Each of them receives X from a majority of the, uh, of the acceptors. They're happy campers, they execute X. Yes? until they have a majority. So an acceptor will execute X as soon as it has a majority of the acceptors telling that it should do X. The, the learner, sorry, the learner will uh, execute X when it has an acceptor, when it has a majority of the acceptors telling it should do X. The acceptor, as soon as it sees, for example, 1-1-X, one, one it hey, just blasts away. Because that's actually what it wanted to do. And then, you know, it could have a response as effect, and that response will be sent back to the, to the client. Okay, so that's the reason why I said the learners actually do the, the work. They actually execute the operation. And they, this is interesting. They all execute the same operation in the same order. Now, let's, let's, let's make uh, this create havoc here. So, now I have this, this proposer sending uh, a prepare one. Okay, and now I'm assuming that the message from one to the, that this message over here gets lost. And I actually did a lot of thinking here because there are going to be a lot of message losses, but at least we're always, and most of the times we're communicating to a majority of whatever group of processes. Okay, so you do prepare one, that's nice. So these two acceptors say, let's go for proposal number one. And then concurrently, how bad can it get? You have this other proposal that says, well, you know, I have this operation Z. And uh, by the way, I have this proposal number three, or uh, two in this case, sorry. And I will tell acceptors, hey, go for two. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not going to hit the first acceptor because that message got lost. You could also translate this, somebody crashed. But let's just do this with, with message loss, OK? So now, watch number two, it says, wait a minute, I just received a higher proposal number. I had one, I have to switch to two. So it switches to two, because that's what the algorithm dictates. Three never saw any message, so it's happy with two, okay? So t number two and number three, they both, they both send a promise back to this proposer saying, hey, you know, we'll go for, uh, we'll go for proposal number two. Good. Whoops. So what happens, let's assume that this happens, that the proposer number one says, okay, well, I got my promises from a majority, so I'll just send an accept. So it sends an accept back, and let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that this accept reaches the first acceptor and the second acceptor. But watch the second acceptor, because it has just promised that it will go for proposal number two. So if it gets an accept for pro proposal number one, it says, tough luck. I, I, I promised someone else that I would do something else. I don't know what yet, but it's not yours. So it does reach the first acceptor, who's now a happy camper because it has one one X, and it sends this to the learners. Ah, uh, no majority. So the lear none of the learners is gonna do anything. Bye bye X. Well, for now. Okay? Let me just go through the whole protocol first. I, you really need some time to let this sink. Took me months. Uh, you'll, 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 you could do with less, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so here's now no, proposal number three. You know, who's gonna, the, the, the winner's going to be number two, of course. So here's proposal number three, and it says it's except, ah, tough luck, two messages get lost. So what happens now is that acceptor number two now sees 2-2-Z, two, two, whoops, this is too fast, tells the learners, ah, oh, tough luck, no majority, bye-bye Z. Got it? Okay. So here comes proposal number two. And it has round number, or proposal number three. So it sends to all of them, prepare three. Unfortunately, its message is lost as it does not reach number two. I did some serious thinking about this. I, uh, I, I don't think I would have come up with this scheme. 
Okay, so it sends them to number one and number three. Watch number one. Now you have to realize that number one and number three are seeing a proposal number that is higher than they've ever seen. So if Paxis says, you know, you gotta adopt that number. Okay? So what one and three will do is say, ah, shit, I'm gonna have to promise number three. I have to go for proposal number three. Okay? And they change their state saying, well, we're going for three, so one now suddenly has three, one X. Three comes from the promise it will just make in a minute, saying, okay, this is the proposal number I'll go for, but I still had X in my queue, which was attached to proposal number one. So what it will do, and, and three has, uh, number three has nothing. What it will do is it will give this information back to the proposer, saying, listen, I'll go for your proposal number, but I'm not going for your command. Because I had one X already accepted, here it is. And it, this, is, this is the crux, to me at least, for Paxos. You now have these acceptors, they are telling this proposer, I love your proposal number, I hate your proposal. I had this accepted operation X, go for it. And tell the others. Okay? So they send this promise back to the proposer number two. Acceptor number three had nothing. Didn't even receive, see a, a, a proposed operation. But what happens now is that proposer number two, who wanted to propose Y, is forced to adopt X and will say, I'll have to go for X. And now you see how it works. It sends the accept 3x to a majority of the acceptors, ah, tough luck, one is out of the loop. Okay, but don't forget, these guys are collaborating. So it sends this message to two of the acceptors. What will happen, of course, is that two sees, oh, I'm getting a, an ex a, a, a whoop, let me go back. I'm sorry, I can use this one. I'm getting an accept message with a proposal number and a command, I need to adapt that one. So it overrides what it has. It now goes for proposal number three, according to the algorithm, and it fully adopts operation X with proposal number three. Acceptor number three does exactly the same thing and adopts proposal number three, operation X, with Proposal number three. And now you see what these two acceptors will do because now, you know, now they have 3-3x. Three, three Bingo. They send it to the learners. And what you'll now see, for example, with learner number one, that it gets a learn x command from two acceptors. What can it do? It can only accept x. And the same holds for number three Tough luck for number two because that message was lost. So it just got one learn, so it's not gonna do anything, but the other two learners are gonna adopt X and execute it, okay? And that was the Paxis algorithm, yes. There was a learn X from, from the top one near the beginning. Yes. Um, oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so the question was the following. Um, the second learner previously had already seen a message learn X. Can it now also, also not execute X? So uh, to be honest, um, I would have to look this up because um, I, would, I, really, I have to think seriously about this. The simplest solution is the one you just proposed, that a learner forgets. You know, if it doesn't get a majority, it just stops. On the other hand, it's a tricky one. I have to think about this. Uh, but you're right, in principle, now did get a, major, a majority on X, so it 
I think it could execute X. But you know, the drawback of these, <coughs> hmm? Well, the thing I'm thinking of is um, as long as it maintains the ordering, it would be okay. And so it would definitely be correct to forget everything. As soon as you see another message, it just overwrites everything. It will just make the whole algorithm slower. But I am thinking that, uh, yes, it would be correct to now execute X, and you have to take into account that maybe other operations in the meantime could have overtaken that thing. Y, for example. Um, but I, I, I don't know for sure. I doubt it, actually. There's something sneaky that I probably don't understand. Well, in this, the version that I just gave you, I, uh, I didn't send the proposal numbers. If you would send the proposal numbers, uh, you could then distinguish the different command operations. Is it necessary to, to have the proposal numbers? Uh, I don't think so, but then I think you need to assume that you uh, ignore previous messages. So this is really an extremely simple case. Just imagine that you would go through this whole song and dance for every operation. So that's not going to make you a fast server. So what really makes Paxos intricate is that you can actually run multiple instances of this protocol completely concurrently, and then what they do is they, they flatten the an entire state space, but you can now see that it actually can get kind of intricate, but it speeds things up tremendously. So th th again, those are, those, are, those are typically things that you would include in the algorithm. For example, the learners could tell the proposers what they actually learned. That will bring proposers in a much better state to see what they could do with their operations, to give you an idea. No, what the proposers can do is then say, just, okay, with, for my proposal, I'll just go through the whole song and dance again. So that's when you can get a trigger from the learner saying, okay, we learned something. Give us something new. And they can go through the whole process again. Notice that there is no, there will be a total ordering of operations, the same ones. Um, so they will reach consensus on what to do. Um, it is not guaranteed that, they're not, they're, a specific ordering is not guaranteed. Okay, so that, that you need to take into account. Yes? Yeah, what, what the, what the, in the end, what the replicated behavior is, why this would be a fault-tolerant group, is that a majority of the learners execute exactly the same command. And that's exactly what you wanted to have in a fault-tolerant group. Because, why, oh, why a majority? I would have to go back to the problematic cases. It's not the case that a single learner only will execute. The learners, what you could do is that you could tell the learners exactly what to do. But I'll, 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 I, I'm, I'm not going to give an answer to this question because... Um, I, I'm in fear of giving the wrong answer. Okay? I believe it's a majority of the learners. So this is the good thing about teaching something for the first time. You can prepare yourself for questions. Yes. So let's, let's, let's in this case, assume that uh, the message to all messages to the third learner will lost, were lost. Okay? What that would mean is that the first learner will be the only one who would execute the operation. And what you need to ensure is that the others will eventually also execute X. So this is, this is where I, I, uh, I will have to look into the system. Okay? The essence, to me, for Paxos, is that the acceptors eventually agree on what to send to the learners and that they actually send the same thing to the learners. But many thanks for your questions because there are still open things. And this is as simple as I could get it. Okay? Uh, there are a few slides left after this, but I'll talk to the, about that uh, tomorrow. Okay?